Hi, I'm Dan Barker, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Instead of our regular live Ask an Atheist this week, we're going to show you the FFRF's 1980 film. It's called A Second Look at Religion. Pay close attention. You'll see Annie Laurie Gaylor's dad, Paul Gaylor, dropping a Bible. And was that on purpose or not? You'll see many luminaries from the free thought movement back then, including Ruth Green, who's the author of the Born Again Skeptic's Guide to the Bible. You'll see our very own Annie Laurie Gaylor and her mother from, from 1980, uh, her mother Ann Gaylor, who's the FFRF founder. And next week, we'll be back with another actual live show where you can ask questions. But for now, enjoy a second look at religion. The program you are about to see is historic. Most of you, for the first time, will be seeing a film that is critical of religion. You will hear people tell why they left their churches, why they no longer believe in religion. You will hear, for the first time, criticism of the Bible. The Freedom From Religion Foundation presents A Second Look at Religion. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city! I will even make the pile for fire great. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Moreover, the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun. Many people are shocked and offended by passages from the Bible. They are distressed by the dark words of Jesus. This is why kind individuals object to the Bible's use in public ceremonies and why they are opposed to prayers and Bible reading in the public schools. I'm a member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, an educational foundation working for the absolute separation of state and church. Those of us who work for separation of state and church would be quite content simply to work for that constitutional principle and remain silent on the subject of the shortcomings of religion. But we find, unhappily, that religionists are not willing to accept our premise that it is constitutionally proper and eminently wise to keep religion out of government. How can you object to prayers in the legislature, they ask? Why shouldn't we have tax money for our parochial schools? And why don't you want the Bible used in public ceremonies? So, we who work for separation of state and church in this country are also forced to talk about religion, to discuss the merits of the Bible. The Bible is probably the most available, most purchased, and least read book in the world. It is the best seller that is rarely opened. Since most religionists have not read the Bible for themselves, and are familiar only with those palatable passages their clergy wish them to hear, 
they're unprepared for any Bible criticism. Criticism of religion in this country has often been stifled. Even in liberal communities, criticism of the Bible is frequently censored. To help one critic's voice be heard, our foundation has published a book, The Born Again Skeptic's Guide to the Bible. It was written by Ruth Hermans Green, a grandmother and foundation member from Missouri. Ruth, I know you were a churchgoer for over half a century. What happened? What changed your mind? You might say I was a half-hearted Methodist. I wasn't uh, happy or comfortable with religion. I wasn't totally committed. I had doubts. I just didn't deal with them. Uh, what led me to my present commitment was a suggestion by a relative that the Bible might not be all that I thought it was. And this suggestion uh, led me to investigate for myself. I read the Bible with an open mind. I was ready to accept it. But I hadn't gotten very far into it before I saw that it was very different from what I had imagined it to be. Different in what way, Ruth? Well, I've been told that the Bible was a good book, an inspirational book. And I can remember singing a song in church about those wonderful words of Christ. And these were the words that I expected to find. Instead, I found a record of, how shall I put it, uh, such superstitious silliness and ignorance, such moral obscenities and such ghastly atrocities as I'd never even imagined. I found the Bible personalities, God's favorites, and even God himself to be utter reprobates. In this book, where I had expected to find ethical guidelines, every kind of behavior that was repugnant to me was glorified and rewarded, even perpetrated and um, commanded by God himself. I felt betrayed. I was outraged that this book should be excerpted in this way and misrepresented. You say you felt betrayed. How was that? Well, after all, I've been more or less exposed to this book all my life without knowing that hardly anyone in it, God included, could serve as a role model for a reputable person who didn't want to end up in prison or on death row. It was this kind of disillusionment that led me to say I detested the Bible. As Thomas Paine said, he detested it in the age of reason. There wasn't one page of this book that didn't offend me in some way. In fact, after a session of reading it, I always wanted to go and take a bath in Grandma's Lysol. If there is human or divine behavior that is too vile to merit description, you'll find it in this book. What specific instances shocked you the most? I think God's behavior offended me the most. After all, I thought it would be above, beyond reproach. But the Bible tells me that this Lord of the whole universe comes down to this little speck of earth and picks out a small group of warring tribes to be his favorites. Now, he doesn't do anything but hover over them and live among them for 4,000 years. He despises everybody else in the world because they have other gods. And he makes his chosen people despise everybody else, too. You have said that the Bible is a book that shouldn't be given to children. Why do you say that, Ruth? I feel deeply that immature minds should not be exposed to the Bible for several reasons. After all, this book is supposed to be the perfect behavior guide. But instead, it's full of violence and depravity and twisted morality. After all, if we uh, tell our children that it's a beautiful act to cause your own child to be killed to appease your anger, I don't know what we can teach them that's reprehensible. And this leads me into my main objection, which is that I don't think children should be exposed to the terrors of the Christian religion. I say this from my own experience. Oh, when I was growing up, I uh, didn't like the awful Bible stories. I was terrified many hours that the end of the world was coming. I shuddered at any mention of torture or the crucifixion. 
I still feel that way today. Easter was a time of horror for me. I wanted to retire from the world. I feel sad that this Christian torture symbol, the cross, is being imposed more and more upon our landscape and even worn as jewelry. And often there's a suffering, bleeding uh, figure attached to it. I don't think we would tolerate this replica of a hangman's noose being used in this way. I think this whole thing is brutalizing. Uh, this emblem of suffering and shame, this uh, old hymn used to talk about, or that we used to sing about, is pictured as something beautiful, when actually it's just a grisly holdover from the old pagan superstition that the gods had to be appeased with human sacrifice. And this became a basic tenet of Christianity. Uh, in fact, Paul says that without shedding of blood is no remission. I don't think that children should be taught these old superstitions of human sacrifice and ghosts and devils and demonology and exorcism and uh, signs and wonders. I think these are horrors of the past and we should bury them. Um, our children shouldn't be made to eat the body of a god or drink his blood, however symbolically. Of course there are good teachings, some good teachings in the Bible. It would be strange if there weren't, considering the number of people who contributed to it and the length of it. But I think that hunting out good behavior in the Bible is like wading through a sewer to find a gem. We shouldn't have to sift our morality from a book, uh, one of whose uh, main uh, themes is the sacrifice of innocent animals and human beings. Uh, there are superior teachings in other books. They're all lined up in your library shelves. But Ruth, what do you say to those people who think that the Bible is a book about love? I studied every page of this book, and I didn't find enough love to fill a salt shaker. God is not love in the Bible. God is vengeance from Alpha to Omega. He doesn't any more than get people created until he curses them and withdraws from them. And he finally comes up with a plan whereby he's going to damn most of them forever. Do you mean God actually did this on purpose? Yes, deliberately. He is the potter who molds the clay to honor and dishonor, which totally nullifies any free will. Uh, Jesus says that the way, the understanding, is deliberately withheld, even from people who want to know it. And he knows that his plan of salvation is going to be damnation for most of the people in the world, because he says, great is the gate and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Predestination is taught all through the New Testament. It makes it very clear that the names of those who are saved are already written in the book of life from the beginning of the world. And not only is this not love, I think it is the most diabolical unfairness that was ever taught or devised. Say, Ruth, what does the Bible have to say about the Christian family we hear so much about today? Personally, I think the Christian family should be called a Christian fantasy. Uh, when the Lord sets up the uh, sexual system, he's very interested in multiplying, but he says nothing at all about the family as a nuclear unit. In fact, he decimates families every time he has a chance. Uh, Jesus is rude to his mother and his siblings. He denies his family. He doesn't marry your father children, and he makes the disciples abandon their family. He says that anyone who wants to follow him must forsake all their loved ones and everything that they have. He never once uses the word family. In fact, that word appears just once in the New Testament. Besides, uh, sex is sinful in the Bible. Women defile men. I just don't see how that attitude is very conducive to producing families. You've told audiences, Ruth, that the Bible is a dangerous book. Why? The Bible is one of 27 holy books, all written by human beings. 
If you can make people believe in a God and then convince them that this God revealed himself in a book, call that the word of God, you have a very powerful tool. And you're not about to relinquish that book. You're going to make it unassailable. And we may not be dragged out of our beds and burned at the stake anymore, but we're still in danger from this book because it's still being used to influence our laws, to deny people their equal rights and freedom of choice. I feel that the Bible is a grab bag. I call it a behavior grab bag because it can be reached into for justification of any kind of behavior, of any kind of crusade or vendetta against any group or person that you want to make your target. There was a song popular several years ago. You may not remember it, but it was called The Three Little Words. Now, these were nice words. I love you. But the three little words that I hate to hear most today, that I dislike to hear the most, are the Bible says, just let somebody say something sensible or a reasonable conclusion you arrived at, and someone pops up with the words, but the Bible says. I feel that we should stop wasting our time trying to please the supernatural and concentrate on improving the welfare of human beings. I think that uh, we should use our energy and our initiative to solve our problems and stop relying on prayer and wishful thinking. I believe that if we have faith in ourselves, we won't have to have faith in God. Ruth Green's second look at religion resulted in her expose of the Bible. Others who take a second look at religion find themselves meeting more restrictive religions. One of these is Mary Weinberger, who grew up in rural Wisconsin and never missed Mass. Today, Mary, an atheist, is a registered nurse and works in a university hospital caring for women who have abortions. She is married to an attorney, Howard Glick. Mary, can you tell us a little bit about your background? For the first 20 years of my life, I was a strict Catholic. I grew up in a small town in northern Wisconsin. I was often called Mary the Good because I was very well behaved and a good Catholic girl. I never missed Sunday Mass, and I even had aspirations about becoming a nun. As a child, did you ever doubt the things you were taught? Yes, but the nuns and priests just told me to pray hard to make the doubts go away. They said the most important goal in life was to make it into heaven. In the long run, nothing else really mattered. What was the result of your studying other religions? I realized that the other religions did not make any more sense than Catholicism. I realized I was Catholic merely because I was brought up that way. So how did you break away? One day I decided I would miss Sunday Mass and deliberately commit my first mortal sin. A mortal sin, according to the Catholic Church, is such a grave offense that if you die before confessing it, you will go straight to hell. How did your family react? They were really upset. My mother said I should come home right away and talk to one of the local priests. She also said I should see a psychiatrist. What happened then? I waited two weeks, and then I decided I would go back to church to see how I would feel. I remember standing there in the pew, trying to pray and follow the Mass, but I just could not do it. I just did not believe those things anymore. I got up and I walked out and I never went back. To this day, I still feel the best decision I ever made was to quit the Catholic Church. Does atheism provide a basis for morality? Atheism is no more or less than the absence of a belief in the existence of God. Atheists are free to search for and find a true basis for morality in the real world using their rational minds. What are the consequences of basing morality on religion? Well, throughout history, religion has done far more harm than good. War, murder, torture, slavery, racism, and sexism have all been practiced in the name of God. 
It is religionists who can and have justified everything in the name of God. The lesson of history is clear. When religion is in control, watch out. Anything goes. Annie Laurie Gaylor is a recent graduate of the University of Wisconsin in Madison, an award-winning journalist in college. She now is the publisher and editor of a new feminist monthly newspaper. She has been an activist for women's rights since she was in junior high school. I understand you're a third-generation freethinker. How has that affected you? I call myself a third-generation freethinker. I feel fortunate that I was brought up in a household free from religion because I've seen the pain that religion has brought friends of mine when they tried to cut the umbilical cord. Even though I was skeptical about the Bible, I was shocked at what I read about its treatment of women, and I think that it would outrage people who've been brought up to believe the Bible is a good book. You said women would be outraged? Why would they be, Annie Laurie? Women would be outraged if they read the Bible because it's one gigantic put down of women. From the first chapters of Genesis, the Bible establishes that women are unclean, that they're inferior to men, and that men should rule over them. The favored version of creation says that woman is created from man's spare rib, that she's an appendage to man. Women in the Bible are owned by men and can be sold into slavery by men. They can even be sacrificed. We've all read about the story of Abraham, who nearly sacrifices his son Isaac to please God. But how many of us have heard of the story of Jephthah and his daughter, who he does actually sacrifice? We haven't heard this story because women and their lives in the Bible are not considered important. Women can even be raped with impunity in the Bible. Is there a particular Bible passage that bothers you the most? The most grisly passage in the Bible deals with a concubine whose master throws her into a crowd of unruly men in order to save his own skin. She's raped all night long, and then she's found at his doorpost dead the next morning. Instead of mourning her or feeling any guilt for his cowardly act in sacrificing her, the man cuts her up into 12 pieces and starts a war. The message of the Bible is clear that she was only a piece of his property and that if he causes her death, that's all right. The Bible sanctions men to have concubines. Men could also use their bondswomen sexually. Um, wise King Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, so that the Bible also allows polygamy. Men could have as many wives as they wanted, but women could only marry one man. But these things that you've mentioned now have just been the Old Testament. What did Jesus have to say? Jesus upheld every jot and tittle of the Mosaic Law, which gives provisions for multiple marriage. He tells a parable about ten virgins all waiting for the same bridegroom, and he doesn't express any disapproval of this at all. What else does the Bible say about marriage? The Bible has some grossly unfair rules about marriage. One of the first rules about marriage is that a woman must be a virgin on her wedding night. If she's not, her father and the men of the village are supposed to stone her to death. A man does not need to be a virgin. Uh, another grossly unfair rule is that a man can divorce his wife by just simply handing her a bill of divorcement. She can't protest, she can't herself divorce her husband, even if he's beating her or if there are any other circumstances like that. And the New Testament, Jesus does not do anything to make this inequity better. He says there shall be no divorce unless the woman is an adulteress. If the man's an adulterer, she can't divorce him. Annie Lloyd, clarify something for me. Just what does the Bible say about abortion? Ironically, the Bible doesn't say anything about abortion at all. It's totally silent on the subject. Instead, you'll find passages such as, their infants shall be dashed in pieces and their women with child shall be ripped up. This hardly promotes respect for life. There is a church that cites five passages in the Bible that it claims are anti-abortion, um, but the passage are all, passages are all similar to, Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. This is hardly persuasive. What you will find in the Bible that is ammunition against abortion rights is that women are supposed to suffer when they are pregnant. They're supposed to bring forth children in agony, and this is what promotes the anti-abortion ideology. Well, what about the other women in the Bible? Women in the Bible are basically evil. Um, there are only two books that are named for women. Ruth, who is the ultimate passive woman. She acts as a doormat in order to win a second husband. And then there's Esther, who's responsible for killing 75,000 people, and that's why she's on her. Um, the only feminist in the Bible is Queen Vashti, who is quickly dethroned when she refuses to uh, subject herself to her husband and display herself before a mob of drunken uh, companions at a dinner. This is the only honorable woman in the Bible that I found. What do you think women should be doing about this sexist book? 
I think that women and men should read the Bible so that if they have first-hand acquaintanceship with what it says about women, they should judge this book on its merits like any other book. And I think that they'll find that a fair-minded person will not want the Bible to be invoked in any of our laws about women. The Bible has tremendous impact on women's lives today because the Bible teaches that women are inferior and 40%, nearly 40% of the population in America believes that this Bible is literally true word for word. Therefore, fighting the Equal Rights Amendment and equal rights for women in general has become a religious crusade. Ann Gaylor is the founder and president of the National Freedom From Religion Foundation. And so much is being said today by the born agains about returning to the religion of the Founding Fathers and the religion of our Constitution. What about that? The born agains are confusing history. What they're really talking about is Plymouth Rock in the early 1600s. They're forgetting that the writing of the Constitution was in the 1780s, a whole century and a half later. The Founding Fathers of our government were the people who wrote the Constitution and signed it. And they, for the most part, were not Christians, they were deists. They had seen some very nasty state church entanglement in the colonies, and they wanted no part of it in the new government. They knew about the persecution of Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams, and they knew about the um, persecution of the Baptists in Virginia and the Catholics in almost all the colonies, and they wanted to put an end to this. They envisioned a government that was free from religion and a constitution where people could practice whatever religious beliefs they wanted to. And believing in this, and believing in freedom from religion, they very purposefully and deliberately wrote a godless constitution. But so many religionists say the constitution is based on God. Of course they do. It suits their purposes to say that, or maybe they really haven't read it. But it is a fact that the United States Constitution is a godless document. There is no reference in it to any deity. In fact, the only references to religion in it are exclusionary, such as there should be no religious test for public office. And at the convention where the Constitution was written, there were no prayers, and I think that's important because it shows intent. I think that the Constitution is something that we can all take pride in and take special pride that we were first among nations to establish the principle of separation of state and church. At no time in our history has the precious principle of state-church separation been under greater attack than it is now. Religionists are attempting to turn our government into a religious government, a theocracy. Literal belief in the Bible is the war cry of the fundamentalists. They tolerate no criticism, no second look at religion. The Freedom From Religion Foundation wants the American people today to do what the Founding Fathers did, to take that second look at religion and then to buttress the endangered wall of separation between church and state.